All right. Second Timothy chapter four. Have to tell you, this has a whole lot of information. And, and to be honest, these last few verses, well, there are enough, there's enough different subject matter in here to have had two or three different messages. You'll see why in just a moment. What I did is I, I broke it down into an introduction and I'm gonna make a couple of applications of some of these people. And hopefully, as we're about to conclude our study here in 2 Timothy, hopefully it'll all tie together for us to have a completed study in this book. So beginning at chapter uh, four, verse 10, Actually, I'll start at verse 9 where I actually taught you last time just to include this so the context is there. Let me begin at verse 9. I'll read to verse 22, and then we'll get into our study. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 9, reading to verse 22. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus, or Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Anisiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, Mike, and Joe. No, I'm... Those are interesting names. And all the brethren... And then he concludes, verse 22, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. In our last study, we noticed that Paul had mentioned four men by name. He mentioned Timothy, his young protege, and asked him to come to see him. He mentioned another by the name of Crescens, and he mentioned Titus. These are two ministers who had gone on a ministry trip. And sadly, he mentioned another. He mentioned a one-time friend and co-laborer by the name of Demas. And Paul's words concerning Demas were sad. They were even sobering. He simply said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and departed for Thessalonica. I mentioned that this kind of final mention is something to, at all costs, do our best to avoid. It should be our greatest desire to remain faithful to the Lord to the very end. And Paul made it very clear that he was doing that when he began to speak of his own life of service because in verse 7, this is how he had concluded. He had said in chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And so that's how we ought to want to finish. We want to finish strong. We want to finish with faith. And, and Paul made it very clear that his life of service was being ended in that way. So at this point, uh, Paul continues writing concerning friends and foes of the gospel. And in the group he now mentions, some are well known and others are, are unknown. So obviously, as we begin our study, let me begin by saying this is a reminder that it's the Lord, the Lord who knows us. Paul had already mentioned this in his letter in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. He had said, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And uh, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But the Lord knows those who are his. So God knows us. Paul said there was a reward awaiting those who faithfully serve Jesus Christ. 
In verse 8 here in 2 Timothy 4, he had referred to this reward as the crown of righteousness. And the reward is the proper reward for faithfully serving him. You'll see that as it's mentioned in other places, how, how that the Lord gives to those who faithfully serve him, the Lord gives rewards to them. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God isn't unjust to forget. He sees what you've done. And sometimes you may be doing things in, in, in a way that nobody notices you. And, and you may be serving the Lord sometimes in a faithful way. And you could even begin to grumble within your heart saying, nobody notices what I'm doing. Nobody says thank you. Nobody acknowledges me. It's like I'm just a, a cog in the wheel of ministry. You can begin to think that way. But the bottom line is, is we don't do these things as unto men, but as unto God. And God is the one who rewards openly. And God is not unjust to forget our works and labor of love. In Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So we're looking at that. And Paul was saying that he was motivated to receive the crown of righteousness and that and all who love the appearing of Christ would also be receiving this crown. And so as we begin, Paul is referring to certain disciples. And in verse 10, he mentions um, a couple of them. Crescens, and it says Crescens for Galatia, and then a second Titus for Dalmatia. So Crescens and Titus also left. But remember, Demas forsook Paul, but Crescens and Titus did not. Crescens and Titus went out with Paul's blessings. Both of them went out to minister to the believers, and both were regarded as faithful servants. When you look at these men, let's look at them individually and just take a moment to do that. Crescens is an unknown disciple but he is mentioned as a leader in the church, as is common. There are many believers mentioned in the Bible, yet unknown to us, and that's normal for the life of a minister. Some are well-known and others are not. There are churches throughout the United States that are pastored by and served by very faithful people, but you don't know them. You know, I always thought that numerically the largest church in the United States was in Houston because they have a reported 43,000 or so people that attend on a weekend. So I've always assumed that this particular church was the largest in the United States. And it turns out it's not, it's the third largest. There's a church in Oklahoma that has 53,000 members. I can't even tell you the name of the city it's in and I don't know the name of the pastor. And that's the largest church in the United States. Did you know there are over 500,000 churches in the United States? Over 500,000 Christian churches. 500,000. Very few of the pastors of those churches are well known. Very few. And so it's unusual and people will know the name of that pastor if they're not part of the church. There are over 500,000 pastors right now, this Sunday, that are teaching the word of God. But the majority of those people are unknown. Plus, those who are serving in the church are unknown also. That's just common. That's the way it works in ministry. Crescens is mentioned here, who is known to those in Ephesus and to those of his day, but are, he's unknown to us. He's a leader of the church. But that, again, being unknown is, is, is normal for the life of a minister. Some are well known and others are not. When I was, on, I was on the East Coast just this last week, people know my name, but they don't know me. And so I'm walking behind some people, some pastors, after one of the sessions before I had gotten up to teach. I taught on Tuesday. This was on Monday. And as I'm walking out, I'm behind three guys, and they're talking about me. They didn't know me, you know, because they only know my name. So one of them says, when's David Rosales going to be teaching? And I'm right there. I could have tapped him and said, tomorrow. <laughs> but they don't know you. You know, and so that, you, that's very possible. You can be known and yet unknown. And in, in the day of Crescens, he was, um, he was known by those in his day, but he's unknown to those in the future church. He's mentioned as a leader. Now, Crescens, it says, went to Galatia. Now, Galatia is um, modern Turkey. So if you were looking at a map, you would simply go up north from Israel and 
move off to the west and, and you're going to enter into, into Turkey. And that's where he was going. He was going to Galatia. Now, when you read your Bible, you notice that the Apostle Paul ministered often in that region, a region called Galatia. And uh, he did so on each of his three missionary journeys. Uh, while he was there, he planted many churches. Believers were very dear to him. And when we read concerning uh, the church of Galatia, churches of Galatia, there were false teachers, we know about it, that entered into the church. And uh, Paul wrote a letter to the, the Galatians concerning this. He knew that, that false teachers were undermining uh, their faith. He was concerned, and he was especially concerned because they were mixing the grace of God with Jewish legalism. These people in history are referred to as the Judaizers, and Paul wrote concerning them. You see, the Judaizers were teaching that salvation was possible only for those who were circumcised and who practiced keeping various Old Testament laws. Their argument was that a Jew, which described most of the early Christians of the period, in order to be a real Christian, must keep such laws. In short, the doctrine of salvation by faith and not by works as was taught by Paul, was being challenged. And he was concerned about that because they were insisting and teaching that believers must be circumcised in order to be saved. And that incensed Paul because they were bringing the church into bondage. So when you read Galatians, you'll read how Paul speaks to them. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he asked this question, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? I was part of a, a board with Pastor Chuck for a number of years, my, my Pastor Chuck Smith. And Chuck would be asked every time we had a, a meeting with, uh, with uh, those who planned the pastor's conferences and all Chuck would be asked a question, and the question always was, Pastor, what is on your heart? What are you concerned about right now? And we would all grow quiet as he answered. And Pastor Chuck always said the same thing. He said, have we begun in the spirit? And are we going to now com be completed by the flesh? My concern is that legalism and flesh will quench the Spirit of God in the movement of Calvary Chapel ministry. The last time we had a meeting with Pastor Chuck, and those of you who knew him, maybe some in this room did, but most of you, of course, wouldn't have. Pastor Chuck was not known to be an emotional man. In, in his latter years, he had had a stroke, and it had contributed to a releasing of emotions quite easily. And he really didn't like it because he found himself crying on occasion. And I had only seen Pastor Chuck cry like one time in all the years that I knew him. And at the end of his ministry, he teared up more than once and teared, off, teared up fairly often. And I remember we were in a meeting with his counsel. And as we were there, he was asked, Chuck, what are you concerned about? Because he was on his way to heaven. He knew that he was going to be dying soon. What are you worried about? What are you concerned? Not worried. What are you concerned about? What is your concern? And with tears, Pastor Chuck got emotional, and with tears he said, I'm concerned that men amongst you will arise drawing disciples after themselves. I'm concerned for the work of our ministry that it isn't taken over by those who want a name but don't want to minister. That's the heart that Paul had. And so Paul was concerned for the Galatians. This I would know. Did you receive the Spirit by the hearing of the law or by the receiving of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect or mature by your flesh? He was concerned. Why? Because the false teachers were saying, you can't really be a believer until you understand the yoke of the law. You need to be circumcised. And Paul was upset about that with the Galatians. In, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul said to them, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And see, so that is something Paul was concerned about. And because he loved the Galatians, he sent a trusted church leader to minister to them. He sent Crescens to that area to minister. He also, in verse 10, mentions a man named Titus. 
He says, Titus left for Dalmatia. Everybody knows Dalmatia. It has these big dogs that are white and black. No, I'm teasing. Somebody's taking their notes. It's um, modern Croatia. Now, Titus, unlike Crescens, is well known to us. When you read their Bible, you'll see Titus. He's a pastor. He's a Gentile, but he was Paul's son in the faith. We know there is a book called the Book of Titus that Paul wrote. And, and he's mentioned nine times in 2 Corinthians and twice in the book of Galatians. And Paul commended him for his sincerity of love for the church as well as his faithful service. In 2 Corinthians 8, 16, he said something that's really remarkable. He said, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. Now, that may not make sense to some in this room, but it does to me. Because in ministry, you don't put people into position who have a desire for power and recognition. You never do that. You don't put somebody in there who, who likes to hear their name mentioned, who wants to be famous. You never do that. What you look for is for somebody who has a heart for people, somebody who doesn't want fame but wants to, to serve God, somebody who doesn't want to be known and noticed, but somebody who will faithfully, no matter if nobody knows them, go out there and do the work of ministry. And he does it not for notice or his name to be known, but he does it because he has love. And so when you see this being spoken of by Titus, I thank I thank God, or of Titus, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. That's a powerful statement coming from the Apostle Paul. You have in Titus somebody who will love you the way I love you. As a um, husband, as father, as a grandfather, I automatically love people who love my wife or love my children or my grandchildren automatically. If you show kindness and love to, to my wife, you're dear to me. If you're kind to my sons and my daughters, you love my kids, I'm gonna love you. If you're kind to my grandbabies that are my heart and you show them kindness and love, I'm gonna love you. And Paul said, I thank God for Titus because the love I have for you is shared by him for you. That's very unusual. That's high praise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, he says, as for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker among you. And so he spoke of Crescens and he spoke of Titus. And now he continues revealing how abandoned he has been by the church because he says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Luke. Luke was Paul's closest friend, a traveling companion. When you look at Luke, you discover some things about this man named Luke. Luke was a Gentile. He was a physician. He was a, a researcher, historian. He was dearly loved by Paul. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul speaks of him as Luke, the beloved physician. It seems that of all those who traveled and ministered with Paul, Luke would have been his closest friend. Somebody said Luke was with Paul in his second missionary journey, and again on his third missionary journey. He accompanied him to Asia, then to Jerusalem, was with him during the captivity time in Caesarea, and subsequently of Rome the first time Paul was imprisoned in the capital. You know Luke, he wrote the gospel as well as the book of Acts. Others had abandoned Paul. Luke remained faithfully by his side. As a physician, undoubtedly he took care of Paul because Paul had failing health. You see, Paul had spoken of his illnesses to the Galatians in chapter 4, verse 13 of Galatians. He said to them, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. In chapter 4, verse 15 of Galatians, he said, I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So there are conservative uh, commentators that say Paul obviously had an, a condition that he had uh, problems with his sight. And he makes reference to that here in chapter 4. As mentioned also, he was a physician. He was Paul's physician. And more than that, he was a friend. And he had remained faithfully by his side. 
In Proverbs 17, verse 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. In Proverbs 18, verse 24, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I do hope that every person in this room, by the way, has a friend like that. Somebody that sticks close to you through thick and thin. Somebody who's there with you no matter what, who's there to help you and to walk alongside of you. Who isn't one who's going to abandon you when you have problems. Somebody who's going to be a friend who sticks closer than even a brother. There are people in this church who have brothers who abandon them, but you have friends who won't. And that's a great thing to have a friend who sticks closer to you, one who was born for adversity. And that was Luke. He was not only his doctor, but he was his close friend. And he makes mention of this man, Luke. But notice also, I want to point something out in verse 11. He also mentions Mark. Get Mark. Bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry or for ministry. I want to spend a moment with you looking at Mark. Because Mark's an interesting guy. And I really believe that he's got a story that we can learn from. When he speaks of Mark, let's begin like this by saying, this is a story of restoration. This is a story of a broken relationship that actually was healed. Because Paul and Mark had a falling out. And so this is a picture of that when he is here simply saying, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful. You see, when you begin to read your Bible, you'll note that in Colossians 4 verse 10, Mark was, was Barnabas' cousin. Barnabas was an early disciple who played a large role in the life of the Apostle Paul. You see, when Paul was saved, the church didn't believe that that was even possible. When you read the story of the conversion of the Apostle Paul, and he gives his testimony in various places in Scripture, Paul speaks about him being injurious. He said, I was a, I was a, a person who was a blasphemer. He, he speaks concerning what he did. He would get people and he would, he would take them and he would have them tried as heretics and then he'd be, there's a witness for their death. This is a man who was, was, was a monster in many ways and the church was greatly afraid of him. And you know the story of his conversion now that he had received letters giving him authority to arrest any who were followers of Christ and to bring them back to have them tried as heretics and put to death. And he was on his way to Damascus when the Holy Spirit, when God himself, rather Jesus, appeared to him on the road to Damascus and won him to faith in Jesus Christ. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The scripture says, Jesus said to him, who is it? Who is it that I'm speaking to, Lord? Who, who am I persecuting? You're persecuting me because whenever you persecute one of those who believe in me, I take it personally. And that's how he got saved. And it was such an amazing conversion. It's the most amazing conversion recorded in scripture. And immediately Paul wanted to, to share and he wanted to speak about the things of the Lord. It says in Acts 9, 26 and 27, and this, at this time he was called Saul. When Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Barnabas. Barnabas, the name Barnabas literally means son of encouragement. And that was Barnabas. He was an encourager. Barnabas was a loving believer. He encouraged Paul. He stood alongside of him. Paul, from the beginning, became a strong preacher of the gospel. God had placed in his heart a desire to preach the gospel to any who would hear. He had said in Romans 15, 20, he said, I've made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on any man's foundation. He said, I took the gospel as far as I could with the strength that God gave to me and faithfully presented it. That's why I have kept the faith. That's why I'm looking forward to the crown of righteousness. That's why I can say that God will give me that crown and those will receive it who also believe in Jesus the way I have. Paul was one of these guys who wanted to take the gospel everywhere. And so he began taking the gospel out on missionary journeys. Acts 12, 25 records that Mark had accompanied Paul on his first mission journey. And then Acts 13, verse 5, uses his other name, John, and mentions that John Mark was Paul's assistant. But for whatever reason, Mark abandoned the mission, returned to Jerusalem, according to Acts 13, 13. That didn't sit well with Paul, because later... Paul decided to go visit the converts that had been saved through his ministry. 
He wanted to check on their spiritual condition, but there was a problem that erupted. In Acts 15, 37 through 40, it says, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. The contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. The discord between them, the disagreement between Barnabas and Paul was so great, they had a division of heart. You can take off with him if you'd like, but I'm not taking him with me, was the attitude of the Apostle Paul. He abandoned us in our mission. Barnabas, you can take him. But now, this, as we're reading 2 Timothy, this is over 20 years later, and I want you to see how Paul speaks of him in verse 11. He says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Now, what happened? What happened from somebody where Paul said, I don't want him with me, to a statement that is saying he's profitable to me or useful in ministry? How did he become profitable? And here we go. Undoubtedly, Barnabas, as an encourager, poured love and understanding upon him. Listen, Mark was not sinfully attracted to this age, to the world, but he also was not mature enough nor ready for ministry. When you go into ministry, especially the kind of ministry that they were involved in, there are dangers, there's labor, there's stress, there's responsibility, there's fatigue, and there's emotional draining. It's, it's not easy. Ministry isn't easy. It's not an easy way of life. People think it is. You know, I've had some, I remember somebody in particular who said, well, what do you pastors do? Uh, you study for one study and you play golf the rest of the week. So I don't know how to play golf, but there are people who really think that that's ministry and it isn't that way. When you're in ministry and you're in a full-time ministry, especially in a mission ministry, you are busy 24 seven, you are moving constantly. And, and Mark saw this in the life of, of Paul. He saw that there were times of stress, there were times of agony, times of prayer, that Paul would get up early and then he would go late and this was daily and he saw this. And so one of the aspects of ministry that might have caused him to have a little bit of a question at least was that he saw how, how emotionally draining and how physically tiring ministry is and perhaps he hadn't been prepared for what ministry actually is. But there's something else that may have caused him to depart. He may not have been open to the revelation of preaching the gospel to Gentiles. Remember, Mark is a Jew, and the Jews did not want anything to do with Gentiles. God in the Old Testament, when he spoke of humanity, divided it into two segments, Jew and Gentile. So the Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles. They didn't worship alongside of them. The only way they would have any kind of relation like that at all would be if the Gentile was, was becoming a convert to Judaism or it's what is called in the New Testament a God-fearer. They'd give them teaching and all, but they didn't have full fellowship with them. In the New Testament, what you have is humanity divided into three. You have Jew, Gentile, and the church. And the church is made up of the Jew and the Gentile making up the body of Christ. And so initially, Paul had been given this sense to go out and bring the gospel to the world, which included the Gentiles. And it happened at such a time that Mark was not open to it. He just wasn't open to it. He may not have been open to the revelation of preaching the gospel of the Gentiles. So Barnabas may have continued ministering to Mark, but Paul didn't see him as ready. Barnabas took Mark with him and mentored him, encouraged his faith, he would have known that the Lord would open his eyes to reach in the world. He would have known that this would take some time. And he worked with them. His love and his patience would have borne fruit in the life of Mark. You see, when Paul was in prison in Rome, Mark was mentioned. When you look at Philemon, verses 23 and 24, Paul says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark. Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Colossians 4, verse 10, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, 
the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. John Mark spent time with the apostle Peter, and he continued growing in faith. Remember that it is Peter who received the revelation of ministering to Gentiles. He was in a, a city called Caesarea. And Peter brought the gospel message to a man named Cornelius, a Gentile, and his household. And when the apostle was speaking to Cornelius in Acts 10, 28, he said, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So he said, I have received a revelation from God that he is open to receive any who come in faith through Christ. But a while later, some years later, Peter hypocritically had separated himself from Gentiles and was rebuked by the apostle Paul. He would have understood Mark's initial response and he could have ministered to him too. And Mark spent time with Peter and was under his spiritual care. And the apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5.13 said, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. What restored him? The loving encouragement of a mature believer and being understood by a mature believer combined, I believe, in the life of John Mark. Because John wasn't being, Mark wasn't being judged and he wasn't being thrown out. He was being encouraged. None of us in this room is perfect, right? None of us. All of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a single person in this room who can say, I am clean from my sin. I am pure. Not a one of us. We all need the grace of God. What a blessing it is if you have failed in some way to have a Barnabas in your life, to have somebody who encourages you, and says, you know what? Your sin may be great, but God is greater still. John says it like this. If my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. He knows all things. And God has a way of restoring the fallen. It's Jesus who looks for the lost sheep, picks it up, brings it back, and nurtures and heals it. And I have no doubt in my mind that I have people in this room right now who have in some way or another failed maybe recently, and your heart's still condemning you. Well, God loves you. He forgives sin. Confess, repent, forsake. He welcomes you. But there are others who are not giving you permission to stay in sin, but giving you encouragement to flee it, who are, who are models of the freedom that Christ gives and hopeful that God will move. And then you'll have someone like the Apostle Peter who can say to you, been there and I've done that. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that God can restore you. I was an alcoholic and I was a person who was a druggie and I got saved and I was gloriously saved, set free. But I found times in my walk with the Lord in, in the earlier days that sometimes I would enter into a valley of sorrow and there were times, not many, but there were some, especially in the first few years, where I failed. And I began to live even as I used to live prior to Christ. But there were people in my life who had great hope in the God who saves and the power of the Spirit, who came alongside of me and were encouragers to me and helped me to get my feet back on the solid ground. And people who understood that's why when I speak to people, and I do in this fellowship, who will walk up and say, I'm in bondage to this or that, alcohol very often, or, 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 or drugs, you know, I'm, 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 I'm free, but sometimes I want to go back. I understand that gravy, and I understand that. Years ago now, my dad, when he was still alive, called me and said, son, can you stop by the house on your way to the office? And I said, of course. So our office was just up the street from where my parents lived, and I remember pulling into the driveway and walking into the kitchen and my dad had this, this shopping bag. He said, I found this in my front yard, son. I don't know what it is, but I kind of figure you do. 
Can you tell me what's in it? And I opened up the bag and it was a kilo of marijuana. And the wafting of that smell of marijuana came into my nose. And instantly there was this sense like, come on back, come on back. Kind of like those cartoons where smoke goes up and then you see a human hand and it's going like that. I rolled up that bag and I said, yeah, dad. I said, I know what this is, this is pot. He said, I figured you would. I said, yeah, I do. He said, can you get it out of here? And I said, I can. I said, I'll go out and burn every stick of it. No, I, I, said, <laughs> I said, of course. And I took it to uh, my office and I gave it to one of the guys on staff. I said, take this to the Chino PD and turn it in and all, you know. But you still, their, their enemy can still just use, your flesh can conspire. It's good to have somebody who's been there. Not to say every person has to in order to help you. There are a lot of sins that haven't been my sin, that I still have scripture to help you. But it's also nice to have, or good to have, someone like the Apostle Peter who could say to somebody like Mark, Mark, God has opened the door. Let me tell you about when I was with Cornelius and, and I was on the rooftop and and there was a, a sheet that was lowered with all manner of creeping things. And the voice of the Lord said, uh, Peter, rise up and slay. And, and I argued with God and I said, no, nothing un, unkosher has ever entered into my, my mouth. I, I can't do that. And the Lord says, do not call unclean what I have declared to be clean. And that's what had driven him to go to talk to a Gentile because it is not lawful for a Jew to have fellowship with a man who is not of the nation of Israel. And he could speak that way and he could say to Mark, listen, Mark, God is bigger than Jew and Gentile. He's creating the church made up of Jew and Gentile. I have that revelation knowledge God gave to me that I'm giving to you. And that would have helped to restore him. And ultimately, the gospel of Mark was written. And there are those who refer to it actually as the gospel of Peter. Because many believe that that gospel that was inspired by the Spirit was dictated by the Apostle Peter himself. And so again, in 1 Peter 5, 13, he says, Mark, my son. So you have a Barnabas and you have someone who understands combining in the life of John Mark. And Paul's last word concerning him, he is useful to me. Or ministry and you can be too God can use you too. you turn away from whatever it is that you're in bondage to turn to the one who liberates you from that and you too can be spoken of as useful or profitable in ministry he goes on in verse 12 Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus Tychicus was the letter bearer he was bringing the letter to the Ephesian church remember Timothy is pastoring a church in Ephesus He's a brother from Asia. He's mentioned in scripture some six times. Again, we know very little of him other than he's a faithful servant of the Lord. So though Paul was alone, he sent him to Timothy's church in Ephesus, delivering the letter. Now he goes on in verse 13, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come and the books, especially the parchments. And these items give us insight into what Paul considered necessary and valuable. He makes a request for a cloak. The cloak was an outer garment used as a blanket. Verse 21 tells us that Paul is facing winter. He needs this to keep warm. It was expensive. He couldn't buy one, so he wanted it brought to him quickly. But he also asks notice for books, and he says especially the parchments. Books were papyrus rolls of the Old Testament. I need the word of God to continue my studies. And the parchments were made of sheep, lamb, goat, or calf membrane. It was used for writing. The parchments may have contained Paul's letters, his study notes, observations that he compiled. They were obviously useful for ministry. And so those are the things that he valued. And those are the things he planned on continuing to use to grow in the things of the Lord. So please bring them. Then he moves into a foe. Alexander, verse 14, the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted 
our words. Now he mentions Alexander, a man who is unknown. He lived in Rome. He made a, a living as a, a metal worker, an idol maker. All of Asia Minor was saturated with idolatry, and this man hated Paul. He opposed him in the gospel that Paul preached. So this made him not only Paul's enemy, but also an enemy of God. And notice how he says, Alexander's done me great harm. He's done me much evil. He has injured me. More than likely, he may have been an accuser for the prosecution at Paul's trial. Great harm was brought on the apostle by, by the things he did and the things he said. And whatever part he had in the trial, the result was damaging and contributed to Paul's death. This is a relentless opponent. He tirelessly resisted Paul's preaching. Alexander was there to resist, to argue against him when he was standing trial. Proverbs 26, 21 says, As charcoal is to burning coals and wood is to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. But I want you to see something in verse 14. Instead of harboring hatred, Paul leaves him in the hands of the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 62, verse 12 says, You render to each one according to his work. Listen, you can fight your own battle. You may win, you may lose. Or you can step out of the way and let the one who never loses, let him in and let him take care of it. Over the years, there have been many times when I've been tempted to step, step up and defend myself from some of the craziest accusations and craziest things that have ever been said. I used to, at first, think people certainly couldn't believe something like that, but they did. And then there'd be times when I would say, I need to say something, but I chose to, to not, to let the Lord fight the battle. Let the Lord take care of it. People will believe what they want to believe. And very often they will believe things simply because they're prone to believe the evil. I mean, let's face it, you watch news if you do at all, and, and they're not telling you about the good things that happen. Normally they want to tell you all the bad. And people hear about the bad all the time. And so we're prone as a nation to believe the bad constantly. So anybody who would stand up and, and say, well, that's really not true, and perhaps you've heard this and there's another side to it. Well, obviously he must be guilty or else he wouldn't defend himself. So a long time ago, I made a decision, and most of the friends I have, pastoral friends that I have, made a decision a long time ago to let the Lord fight the battle. Because my pastor taught me something that I've never forgotten. He said, I could fight. I may win, but I often lose. Or I can trust the one who never loses. He says, I have just chosen to trust the one who never loses. He will take care of the cause. And that's what Paul did here. He said, the Lord is going to deal with him. May the Lord repay him according to his works. But he warns him, verse 15, beware of him. He has greatly resisted our words. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me. All forsook me. May it not be charged against him, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear also. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. At my trial, not a single friend or believer supported me. No one was willing to testify on my behalf. Instead, they all deserted me. It would seem that Onesiphorus and Luke were not in Rome when he was tried. Now, he had earlier written, all those in Asia have turned away from me. They were fearful, didn't want to identify with Paul. It would seem they denied Paul. Notice this, but they had not denied Jesus, that gives us insight. They were ashamed of Paul. But in 2 Timothy 1.8, he had said, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So he says, they may not have stood with me, verse 17, 17 but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. I was abandoned by man. I am never abandoned by God. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? My very first message I ever gave in a pulpit in a church service was back in 19, I believe, 78 or so. And the message was never alone. My testimony was very simple, I'm not going to give it to you now, don't worry. But it's very simple. In, when I grew up in the 50s, 
my mother had illnesses and my mom was going through so many things in many ways depressed she felt it was safer for her not to be in the home because my mom became abusive and so my mom took outside jobs so that she wasn't home. And as I was growing older, eight, nine, 10 years old, I had two sisters, an older brother, and I would come home. And very often my mom was gone at work and I would take care of the kids. And so in my testimony, I share that if there was ever a boy that was lonely, it was me. Because I, I felt my mom had left, my dad wasn't around, I was by myself. I had the responsibility of taking care of my sisters. and. And I became very withdrawn and I would stay in my room and I became very shy towards others. Long story made short. And then when I got saved, one of the things that the Lord spoke to my heart is you are never alone. I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. And so when I taught my first study, John 16, 33, now I'm alone, yet I'm not alone for you are with me, Jesus said. That's what I learned in salvation that Though, though I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And so God's word states that very clearly we need to apply that to our life because there are times when, when we feel there's nobody there to support us, nobody understands us. There are times when husbands may turn to the wife and say to the wife, you don't get it, baby, you don't know what I'm going through. Or the wife will be going through something and try and tell the husband, say, look, I'm going through this. And the husband will look and doesn't connect, doesn't understand. It's not that he doesn't want to. It's just not in his wheelhouse. He doesn't know how. He doesn't know how. And so you, you feel alone. You're isolated. You, you go to your room. You sit by yourself. You, you, you're, you don't have anybody to speak to. Understand this. If you do, God will change your life. You are never alone. You are never alone alone. I am with you, he said. I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. Man will. God forgive us. We're not capable of always being there for every need. We're just not as much as we want to. We can't. But there is one who is. And that's what Paul was saying. He said, listen, I've been abandoned. Alexander the coppersmith has done me much harm. Demas forsook me. At my trial, nobody stood with me, but the Lord did, and the Lord will. That's something you need to understand. Maybe on the job site right now, you're going through some tough time. Maybe in your neighborhood, you're being isolated. Maybe in school, you're having a problem. Maybe in your marriage, you're being misunderstood. Don't forget, there's one who never forsakes you. He's always with you because he loves you, and he will not forsake you. He's there for you. And for that, you ought to be grateful because your God loves you. And Paul understood that. And Paul was saying that the Lord stood with me, strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all Gentiles might hear. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The lion may have various applications. When you read 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Satan is called a roaring lion. So it could be speaking of Paul avoiding the traps of the enemy. Paul spoke fearlessly because God didn't give him a spirit of fear. So he finished well. There are others who say that this is a, uh, a nod to Caesar Nero. Proverbs 20 verse 2 says the wrath of a king is like the roaring of a lion. So it could speak of, of Paul not experiencing immediate execution. But he goes on to say the Lord will deliver me. God will grant me courage in my time to die. I will not show fear. This is all part of God's design for me. I have fought. I have finished. I have kept the faith. And it's time for me to go home to be with the Lord. And I embrace it joyfully. And then finally, verses 19, and we'll close. Greet Prissa and Aquila, the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I, I left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So we'll wrap up with various greetings. I'll just touch on this lightly. He speaks of uh, Prissa and Aquila. Prissa is also known as Priscilla. They're very good friends. They're ministers of the gospel. He speaks of Onesiphorus. 
He was mentioned earlier as a faithful minister. In verse 20, he speaks of Erastus. He's mentioned as a missionary. He re remained in the city of Corinth. You have Trophimus, an Ephesian minister who traveled with Paul when he left, uh, whom he left in Miletus, and he left him in Miletus sick, which is interesting. Notice that Paul doesn't say that Trophimus claimed a healing and was healed. There are teachers of error who say healing is automatic if you simply claim it. But that flies in the face of Scripture. It sows seeds of discouragement in the one who hasn't been healed. I would say this, God is the healer, but healing is not guaranteed in Scripture. Sickness is part of the curse. That's why in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul said to Timothy, stop drinking only water, use, it, use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illnesses. That's why you have elders in the church who pray for you that you may be healed. James 5, 14 and 15 says, Is any one of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sinned, he will be forgiven. And so there is a place for prayer and the sovereignty of God in healing. So he speaks concerning that. And then he finally concludes, do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, all the brethren. The three men's names are Latin. They may be Roman converts. Claudia is also unknown. And then he closes, and I'll close with this. Verse 22, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Final words, final letter. The Apostle Paul, this is his last letter, and the Apostle Paul was taken out of his cell after he, he was judged and condemned. Church history says that he was taken out to a place called the Appian Way. He knelt on the ground. They took a sword and removed his head from his shoulders. Died the death of a martyr, but he died with victory. I had mentioned to you the epitaph of Demas, where Paul simply said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present age. Those are the words that Paul spoke of Demas. But what were Paul's final words, his last thing he ever wrote to us? It was a blessing. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul knew he was going to die. And he said, this is the thing that is most important. And I'm going to close with this. This is the thing that is most important. May the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That was what was on his lips. When my father had a heart attack back in 2001, and he was in the hospital, my brother and I went to see him. And as we were standing next to him there in that bed in Pomona Valley Hospital, as I was standing there talking to my father, my father turns to me and he starts speaking to me about his final plans. And he says to me, David, I don't want you to do my funeral. I'll never forget this conversation. I don't want you to do my funeral. I want another minister to do it, somebody that my father loved very much, a man by the name of Marco. He said, I want Marco to do my funeral. And I said, no. I said, Marco's not going to do your funeral. I said, Daddy, I brought you into faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to send you home. I'm going to do your funeral. Now, I have to be honest with you. I thought my dad was being a little melodramatic at the moment. I, I thought Daddy was just beginning to think of what was going on and, and was just, just saying things. And I thought, you know, that happens sometimes. That's what happens. You know, you start giving final thoughts and all, and my dad's going to live another 10, 20 years. He's just right now feeling a little down. That's what I was thinking. So he said, can you do it, son? And I said, of course, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, dad. I can share at your funeral. And he said, okay. Okay, then, son, you do it. He says, but let me also say this. He says, in, he says, in my bedroom, I have in my closet on the shelf a green tin box. It has my treasures. These are my most precious treasures. I have my treasures in that box. So when I die, you can open, open the box. So 
I said, okay, Daddy. Again, thinking that he's being melodramatic, I, I don't, I say, okay. Well, to, to my shock, my father died. I did not expect it. I, I did not expect it. And I really emotionally wasn't prepared for it. And after doing so many things I had to do, I had to go to the hospital. I rather, I was at the hospital when he died. Then I, I went to pick my sister up at the airport. She didn't know daddy had died and I had to pick her up. And, and I told her there in Ontario at the, at the airport that daddy didn't make it, daddy's in heaven. And she erupted with tears and all of you have been there. If you haven't, you will be. Went home after coming here and announcing a guest speaker for the men's Tuesday evening, a Thursday evening study. I went home, began to gather my heart, my thoughts, and the next day I went to my father's house and it was night, very dark, he didn't have any lights. It was very dark and my brother comes walking out of the front door and he walks towards me and he says to me, Dave, I opened up daddy's treasure chest. I opened up the box with his treasures and he said, do you know what was in it? And I said, no. I, I, I assumed it must be insurance, must be the deed to the house, important papers. So I said, well, what were in it? His deed? And my brother shakes his head and he says, no. He said, I opened it today and looked at it. He said, David, it was it was Father's Day cards that we had given to him when we were six and seven years old. You know the ones that you draw the outline of your hand and you write Happy Father's Day? It was that. He said it was report cards, it was clippings. He said pictures of us when we were little boys and, and my sisters were little girls when we were six, seven, eight years old. It was filled with his memories, with his treasures. My father's word, that box holds my treasures, the most important things to me. I had thought they would have a deed to the house. I thought it would have insurance, something. No, he kept those. They were in a cardboard box, a shoe box. Because if the house burned down, he didn't care if he lost those. He could get copies, but he could never get a copy of pictures of me when I was six. He could never get copies of clippings from newspapers that had my name in it. He could never get those. My father's last words were words of love for a family. Words of things that matter. What will your last words be? When your kids standing around you or your friends are there and you're looking at them and you know this is it. Paul said, may God's grace be with you. That's what matters. In the end, may his spirit be with you. May God's grace be with you. And that is what I plan should the Lord give me strength and ability when my babies and grandbabies are standing around me, when it's time for me to go to heaven, there will be tears. I won't pretend, they won't. There will be, because I love my family. But I'm not gonna say good luck, have a nice journey. I'm gonna say may the grace of God be with you and your spirit. May God move in your life so that you serve him. And one day we will be joined together once again in the presence of God and we will rejoice forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen.